Collection of Passages on the Reality of Buddha Nature Here is a collection of passages that will help you contemplate on the teaching explained at Chapter 2. Quote, The essence of the well-gone one pervades all migrators. End quote. King of Meditative Absorption Sutra Quote, All sentient beings have the essence of the thus gone one. End quote. Small Parinirvana Sutra. Quote, For example, as butter permeates milk, likewise the essence of the thus gone one pervades all sentient beings. End quote. Mahahana Parinirvana Sutra. Quote, the Mahahana Parinirvana Sutra states, quote, The one vehicle is called Buddha nature. For this reason, I proclaim that each and every sentient being possesses Buddha nature. All sentient beings possess the one vehicle. Because it is covered over by their ignorance, they cannot see it. End quote. The Garland Sutra states, quote, The bodies of all the Buddhas are only one Dharma body, that is, Dharmakaya of Dharma nature or Buddha nature. They possess one and the same mind and wisdom. Their ten powers and four fearlessnesses are equally the same. End quote. Commenting on the above passages, Shinran Shonen added, quote, Now we see that the spiritual attainment described above, that is the attainment of Buddha nature, is all the great benefit to be gained in the pure land of peace and provision, and the inconceivable ultimate virtues actualized by the Buddha's primal vow. End quote. Shinran Shonen Kyagya Shinsho quote, One who has seen Buddha nature is no longer a sentient being. End quote. Maha Parinirvana Sutra as quoted by Shinran Shonen in his Kyagya Shinsho quote, May all sentient beings destroy their evil passions forever and clearly see Buddha nature. End quote. Maha Parinirvana Sutra as quoted by Shinran Shonen in his Kyagya Shinsho Quote, further liberation is called unsurpassed supremacy. Unsurpassed supremacy is true liberation. True liberation is Tathagata. When one has realized highest perfect enlightenment, one becomes free of attachment and doubt. Being free of attachment and doubt is true liberation. True liberation is Tathagata. Tathagata is Nirvana. Nirvana is the inexhaustible. The inexhaustible is Buddha nature. Buddha nature is certainty. Certainty is highest perfect enlightenment. Bodhisattva Kasyapa said to the Buddha, World honored one, if nirvana, Buddha nature, certainty and Tathagata are terms that have the same meaning, why do you teach the three refuges? The Buddha replied to Kasyapa, Son of good family, all sentient beings seek the three refuges because they fear samsara. Through the three refuges they come to know of Buddha nature, certainty and nirvana. End quote. Maha Parinirvana Sutra as quoted by Shinran Shonen in his Kagyo Shinsho. Quote, Since Tathagatas are eternal and not subject to change, they are called true reality. End quote. Maha Parinirvana Sutra is quoted by Shinran Shonen in his Kagyo Shinsho. Quote, Space is neither within nor without, but all sentient beings possess it. So it is with Buddha nature. End quote. Maha Parinirvana Sutra is quoted by Shinran Shonen in his Kagyo Shinshu. Quote, those who violate the four major prohibitions, those who commit the five grave offenses, and Ichitankas, all have Buddha nature. End quote. Maha Parinirvana Sutra as quoted by Shinran Shonen in his Kagyo Shinshu. Ichantikas are those who have no stock of good karma, and thus no possibility of attaining Buddhahood through their personal power. However, they and all the lowest beings have Buddha's, Buddha nature. Quote, Sons of good families, I always declare that all sentient beings have Buddha nature. This is the teaching that is in accord with my own intention. Although they all have Buddha nature, they cannot see it because it is covered over by evil passions. End quote. Maha Parinirvana Sutra, as quoted by Shinran Shonen in his Kagyo Shinshu. Quote, all Buddhas, world honored ones, see Buddha nature with their eyes as clearly as if they were looking at it, at a mango in the palm of their hand. 
End quote. Maha Parinirvana Sutra is quoted by Shinran Shonen in his Kagyo Shinsho. Quote, what is not true is not thusness. What is not thusness is not the Tathagata. End quote. The Sutra on utterly quiescent and certain magical meditative concentration. What is known as Tathagata essence is Nirvana, indestructible like space and sky. The past, present and future, blessed Buddhas presented with the word Nirvana and the term basic space of phenomena. End quote. Gana Vyaha Sutra. Quote, the Nirvana realm is the Dharmakaya of the Buddha. The attainment of the Dharmakaya is the one vehicle. The Buddha is not different from the Dharmakaya. The Buddha is himself the Dharmakaya. End quote. Queen Shamala and her Lion's Roar Sutra. The discovered Buddha nature is called Dharmakaya. Quote, there is no doubt that the Buddha nature is obscured by all the stores of defilements. There is also no doubt that the Dharmakaya of the world honored one transcends all the stores of defilement. End quote. Queen's Shramala and her Lion's Raw Sutra. Quote, the nature of mind, that is Buddha nature, as the element of space does not depend upon causes or conditions, nor does it depend on a gathering of these. It has neither arising, cessation, nor abiding. This clear and luminous nature of mind is as changeless as space. It is not afflicted by desire and so on. The adventitious stains which are sprung from incorrect thoughts. It is not brought into existence by the water of karma, of the poisons, and so on. Hence, it is also not consumed by the cruel fires of dying, falling sick, and aging. End quote. Bodhisattva Maitreya, the Mahayana Uttarantana Shastra. This Tathagatagaba abides within the shard of the afflictions, as should be understood through the following nine examples. Just like a Buddha in a decaying lotus, honey amidst bees, a grain in its husk, gold and filth, a treasure underground, a shoot, and so on, sprouting from a little fruit, a statue of the victorious one in a tattered rag, a ruler of mankind in a destitute woman's womb, and a precious image under a layer of clay. This Buddha element, or Buddha nature, abides within all sentient beings, obscured by the defilements of the adventitious poisons. The defilements correspond to the lotus, the insects, the husk, the filth, the earth, the fruit, the tattered rag, the pregnant woman, direly vexed with burning suffering, and the clay. The Buddha, the honey, the grain, the gold, the treasure, the Nyagrodra tree, the precious statue, the continent's supreme ruler, and the precious image are similar to the supreme undefiled element, or Buddha nature. Seeing that in the calyx of an ugly colored lotus, a Tathagata dwells ablaze with a thousand masks, marks. A man endowed with the immaculate div divine vision takes it from the shroud of the water-borne petals. Likewise, the Sugata, with his Buddha eye, perceives his own true state, even in those who must abide in the hell of direst pain. Endowed with compassion itself, which is unobscured and endures to the final end, he relieves them from their obscurations. Once his divine eye sees the Sugata abiding within the closed ugly lotus, the man cuts the petals, seeing the perfect Buddha nature within beings, obscured by the shroud of desire, hatred and the other mental poisons. The Muni, that is, the sage or the Buddha, does likewise, and through his compassion defeats all their veils. Honey is surrounded by a swarm of insects. A skillful man in search of honey employs upon seeing the suitable means to fully separate it from the host of bees. Likewise, when his eye of omniscience sees the honey-like element of awareness, or Buddha nature, the great sage causes its bee-like veils to be fully and radically abandoned. Aiming to get honey that is obscured by millions and millions of honeybees, the man disperses all these bees and procures the honey just as he wishes. The unpolluted knowledge present in all sentient beings, that is Buddha nature, is similar to the honey. And the victor, that is the Buddha, skilled in vanquishing the bee-like poisons, resembles the man. A grain, when still in its husk, is not fit to be eaten by man. Those seeking food and sustenance remove this grain from its husk. The nature of the victorious one, which is present within beings, but mixed with the defilement of the poison, 
poisons is similar to this. While it is not freed from being mingled with the pollution of these afflictions, the deeds of the victor will not be displayed in the three realms of existence. That is, one who has not discovered his Buddha nature cannot truly help sentient beings. Unthressed grains of rice, buckwheat or barley, which not having emerged from their husks, still have husk and beard, cannot be turned into delicious food that is palatable for man. Likewise, the Lord of Qualities, that is Buddha nature, is present within all beings, but his body is not liberated from the shard of the poisons. Thus, his body cannot bestow the joyous taste of Dharma upon sentient beings stricken by the famine of their afflictions. While a man was travelling, gold he owned fell into a place filled with rotting refuse. This gold, being of indestructible nature, remained for many centuries just as it was. Then a god with completely pure divine vision saw it there and addressed a man, Purify the supremely precious gold lying here in this filth and then convert it into something that is worth being made from such a precious substance. Likewise, the Muni or the sage or the Buddha sees the quality of beings which is sunken in the filth-like mental poisons and pours his rain of sacred Dharma upon them to purify the muddiness of their afflictions. Once the god has seen the gold that has fallen into the place full of rotting refuse, insistently he directs the man's attention to this supremely beautiful thing so he may completely cleanse it. Seeing within all beings the precious perfect Buddha that has fallen into the great filth of the mental poisons, the victorious one does likewise and teaches the Dharma to persuade them to purify it. If an inexhaustible treasure were buried in the ground beneath a poor man's house, the man would not know of it, and the treasure would not speak and tell him, I am here. Likewise, a precious treasure is contained in each being's mind. This is its true state, which is free from defilement. Nothing is to be added and nothing to be removed. Nevertheless, since they do not realize this, sentient beings continuously undergo the manifold sufferings of deprivation. When a precious treasure is contained within the ground beneath a poor man's house, the treasure cannot tell him, I am here, and the man does not know of its presence. Like the poor man, beings are unaware that the Dharma's treasure, that is the Buddha nature, lies in the house of their minds, and the great sage truly takes birth within the world to cause them to attain this treasure. Buddhas appear in the world to help beings awaken to their innate Buddha nature. This is also the reason why Shakyamuni came to this world and taught Amida Dharma. The seed contained in the fruit of a mango or similar trees is possessed of the indestructible property of sprouting. Once it gets ploughed, earth, water and the other conditions and substance of a majestic tree will gradually come about. The fruit consisting of the ignorance and the other defects of beings contains in the shroud of its peel the virtuous element of the Dharmakaya or Buddha nature. Likewise, through the through relying on virtue, this element also will gradually turn into the substance of a king of Munis, that is, king of sages or the Buddha. By means of water, sunlight, wind, earth, time and space, then necessary conditions, the tree grows from within the narrow shroud of the fruit of a banana or mango. Similarly, the fertile seed or Buddha nature of the perfect Buddha contained within the fruit skin of the mental poisons of beings also grows from virtue as its necessary condition, until the shoot of Dharma is seen and augmented towards perfection. An image of the victorious one, made from precious material, lies by the road, wrapped in an evil-smelling, tattered rag. Upon seeing this, a god will alert the passerby to its presence by the road, to cause its retrieval. Likewise, being possessed of unhindered vis vision, the Buddha sees the substance of the Sugata, Buddha nature, wrapped in the multitude of the mental poisons, even animals, even in animals, and teaches the means to free it. When his eye perceives the statue of the Tathagata, which is of precious nature, but wrapped in a stinking rag, and lying by the road, the god points it out to passers-by, so that they retrieve it. Likewise, the victor, that is the Buddha, sees that the element, the Buddha nature, wrapped in the tattered garments of the poisons, and lying on samsara's road, is present even within animals, and teaches the Dharma so that it may be released. A woman of miserable appearance, who is without protection, 
and abides in a poor house, holds in her womb a glorious king, not knowing that a lord of man dwells in her own body. Birth in an existence is similar to the poor house. Impure beings are like the woman bearing a king in her womb. Since he is present within her, she has protection. The undefiled element is like the king who dwells in her womb. A ruler of the earth dwells in the womb of a woman who has an unpleasant appearance and whose body is dressed in dirty clothes. Nevertheless, she has to abide in a poor house and undergo the experience of direst suffering. Likewise, beings deeming themselves unsheltered, though a protector resides within their own body or their own minds. Thus they have to abide in the ground of suffering, their minds being unpeaceful under the predominating drive of the mental poisons. Beings wander in samsara aimlessly and experience all kinds of suffering, although their innate Buddha nature is perfectly enlightened and free. An artistically well-designed image of peaceful appearance, which has been cast in gold, and is still inside its mould, externally has the nature of clay. Experts, upon seeing this, will clear away the outer layer and cleanse the gold therein. Likewise, those of supreme enlightenment, that is the Buddhas, fully see that there are defilements on the luminous nature, that is the Buddha nature, but that these stains are just adventitious and purifier beings, who are like the jewel mines from all their veils, recognizing the nature of an image of peaceful appearance, flawless and made from shimmering gold, while it is still contained in its mould. An expert removes the layers of clay. Likewise, the omniscient, that is, the Buddha, knows the peaceful mind, or the Buddha nature, which is similar to pure gold, and removes the obscurations by teaching the Dharma, just as the mould is struck and chipped away. The lotus, the bees, the husk, the filth, the earth, the skin of the fruit, the tattered rag, the woman's womb, and the shroud of clay exemplify the defilements. While the pure nature is like the Buddha, the honey, the kernel, the gold, the treasure, the great tree, the precious statue, the universal monarch, and the golden image, it is said that the shard of the mental poisons which causes the veils of the elements of beings, or Buddha nature, has had no connection with it since beginningless time, while the nature of mind, or Buddha nature, which is devoid of stains, has been present within them since beginningless time. End quote. Bodhisattva Maitreya the Mahayana Uttarantantra Sashastra. Quote, As is pure gold, water free from dirt, the sky without a cloud, so is the mind pure when detached from the false imagination. End quote. The Lankavatara Sutra. The mind here stands for the Buddha nature. Quote, what is meant by an internally abiding reality? The ancient road of reality, Mahamati, has been here all the time like gold, silver or pearl observed in the mind. Mahamatni, Mahamati, the Dhammadhatu or Buddha nature abides forever, whether the Tathagata appears in the world or not. As the Tathagata eternally abides, so does the reason or Dhammata of all things. Reality forever abides. Reality keeps its order, like the roads in an ancient city. For instance, Mahamati, a man who is walking in a forest and discovering an ancient city with its orderly streets may enter into the city, and having entered into it, he may have a rest, conduct himself like a citizen, and enjoy all the pleasures accruing therefrom. What do you think, Mahamati? Did this man make the road along which he enters into the city, and also the various things in the city? Mahamati said, No, blessed one. The blessed one said, Just so, Mahamati. What has been realized by myself and other Tathagatas is this reality, the eternally abiding reality, the self-regulating reality, the suchness of things, the reality of things, the truth itself. End quote. The Lankata Vatara Sutra. The eternally abiding reality is the Buddha nature, which is uncreated just like the ancient city with its orderly streets were not created by the traveller but only discovered by him. Quote, the essence of suchness, that is Buddha nature, knows no increase or decrease in ordinary men, the Hinayanists, the Bodhisattvas, or the Buddhists. It was not brought into existence in the beginning, nor will it cease to be at the end of time. It is eternal, through and through. Master Ashvagosha, awakening faith in the Mahayana. Quote, the Tathagata Alba has no beginning, and that therefore ignorance has no beginning. 
If anyone asserts that sentient beings come into existence outside this triple world, he holds the view given in the scriptures of the heretics. Again, the Tathagatagaba does not have an end, and the Nirvana attained by the Buddhas being one with it, likewise has no end. end quote. Master Ashvagosha, Awakening Faith in the Mahayana. Quote, we have roamed about in one confused state of experience after another endlessly. At the same time, we haven't lost our Buddha nature. Our Buddha nature is never separated from our minds. Though we are not apart from it, we do not know it, and thus we wander in samsaric existence. The Buddha nature pervades all sentient beings. We have not lost it. It has never been apart from our mind for even a single instant. This Buddha nature is always present, and the only thing that conceals it is our own thinking. Nothing else obscures it. The essence becomes obscured by the expression. The expression of our own attention takes the form of the confused thinking that obscures us. In other words, we are obscuring our own Buddha nature. End quote. Turgen Ergen, Tulku Ergen Rinpoche, the fourth Dharma of Gampopa. Quote, when pure gold is covered by dirt, it is not obvious that it is gold, even though this dirt is temporary. But once the dirt is removed, we realize that the gold is gold. In the same way, when our confusion is purified, the wisdom that is our basic wakefulness is made manifest. At present, the state of ordinary people is like pure gold covered with dirt. Our Buddha nature is covered by temporary obscurations. Once it is purified, then gold is just pure gold. As long as our mind is confused, bewildered, deluded and mistaken, our Buddha nature continues to be dragged through the realms of samsara. But when the mind is unconfused, unmistaken and undeluded, it is the Buddha nature itself. End quote. Tulku Ergen Rinpoche, the fourth Dharma of Gampopa. Quote, if we did not already have this wish-fulfilling jewel, that is the Buddha nature, it would be difficult to find. But as a matter of fact, through all our beginningless lifetimes, we have never been without it. If we were told, we must possess a wish-fulfilling jewel, then we, we would be in trouble, because we would suddenly have to come up with something we do not possess. But the wish-fulfilling jewel of Buddha nature is already present in us. It is because of our ignorance and delusion that we do not recognize it, and continue life after life among the six classes of sentient beings. How sad that people throw away what is really valuable and instead chase after food, wealth, a good reputation and praise. End quote. Tulku Ergen Rinpoche, the fourth Dharma of Gampopa. Quote, this awakened mind of awareness is not made out of any material substance. It is self-existent, existing and inherent in yourself. End quote. Padmasambhava, pointing the staff at the old man. Quote, Samsara is being caught up in unwholesome action and circling among the six classes of beings from one state to another. Nirvana is having recognized the nature of mind, that is Buddha nature, and thereby having totally cut through samsaric attachment. Unknowing, that is Marigpa, is not knowing the nature of mind. Knowing, that is Rigpa, is the knowing of the original wakefulness. End quote. Sri Singha, the ten profound points of essential advice. Quote, this Buddha nature is present in everyone, from the Dharmakaya Buddha Samantabhadra down to the tiniest insect, even the smallest entities you can see only see through a microscope. In all of these things, the Buddha nature is identical. End quote. Tulku Ergen Rinpoche, The Inheritance. Quote, we need to distinguish between mind and mind essence. The mind essence of, essence of sentient beings and the awakened mind of the Buddhas is the same. Buddhahood means being totally stable in the state before dualistic thought occurs. A sentient being like ourselves, not realizing our essence, gets caught up in our own thinking and becomes bewildered. Still, the essence of our mind and the very essence of all awakened Buddhas is primordially the same. Sentient beings and Buddhas have an identical source, the Buddha nature. Buddhas become awakened because of realizing their essence. Sentient beings become confused because of not realizing their essence. Thus, there is one basis or ground, and two different paths. End quote. Tulku Ergen Rinpoche, The Inheritance. Quote, A Buddha is someone who has recognized the essence itself, and has awakened through that. The sentient being is someone who hasn't. 
and who is confused by his or her own thinking. Someone who has failed to recognize the essence of mind or the Buddha nature is called a sentient being. Someone who has realized the nature itself and becoming stable in that realization is called a Buddha. End quote. Tulku Ergin Rinpoche, The Inheritance. Quote, I bow at the feet of the masters who teach that, like a butter lamp within a vase, the treasure of a pauper, and so forth, the Sugata essence, that is Buddha nature, luminosity or the Dharmakaya, exists within the sheath of the relative incidental aggregates. I bow at the feet of the masters who carefully distinguish all imagined and dependent phenomena are non-existent, but the fully established true nature is never non-existent. I bow at the feet of the masters who teach all relative phenomena are merely the dependent origination of cause and result, but the self-arisen absolute, that is Buddha nature, transcends dependent origination. End quote. Dolpopa Sherab Gelson, General Commentary on the Doctrine. Quote, I bow at the feet of the masters who teach all outer and inner phenomena are merely the confusing sphere of ignorance. But the other is the true nature, self-arisen primordial awareness, drawing the distinction between consciousness, mind stream of unenlightened beings, and primordial awareness, that is Buddha nature, samsara and nirvana, and the two truths. I bow at the feet of the masters who distinguish and teach the relative three worlds are just an exaggerated, confusing appearance, while the absolute three worlds, the Sagata essence or Buddha nature, are an indestructible, unimagined, unconfusing appearance. Dolpopa Sherab Gelson, General Commentary on the Doctrine. Quote, I bow to you who teach that united, indivisible, equal-flavored, indestructible, self-arisen, primordial awareness, the primordial Buddha, is present in all as thusness with stains. It is like the sky and exists as the universal ground. End quote. Dolpopa, Sherab Gelson, General Commentary on the Doctrine. The Buddha nature or thusness is present in all of us, but it is covered with the stains of illusions, blind passions and attachments. These stains will be removed automatically after we are born in the pure land of Amida, making us able to see our Buddha nature. Quote, if it is consciousness, it is not self-arisen primordial awareness. If it is consciousness, it is not permanent, stable and eternal. If it is consciousness, it is not the Sugata essence. If it is not consciousness, it is not great nirvana. If it is natural luminosity, it is not consciousness. End quote. Dolpapa Sherab Gelson, the Fourth Council. Here consciousness stands for the mind stream of unenlightened beings, which is not the Buddha nature or primordial awareness, natural luminosity, the eternal Sugata essence and nirvana. These two should not be confused, nor treated as the same thing, as Dolpopa further instructed. Quote, Since primordial awareness and consciousness are just like light and darkness, and exist like nectar and poison, it is completely impossible for them to have a common ground, so do not mix them together as one. If they are mixed together, the Buddha's doctrine is damaged and not clarified. End quote. Illusions, blind passions, attachments, that is, incidental stains, are not the Buddha nature, that is, the ground of purification, universal ground, primordial, just like the sky is not the clouds that cover it. Quote, the ground of purification is the universal ground, primordial awareness, that is, like the sky. The object of purification is the incidental stains that are like clouds. The purifying agent is the truth of the path that is like a relentless wind, and the result of purification is the separated result that is like the sky free of clouds. Thus it has been taught by many adherents of the flawed Treta Yuga and later eons, who are not expert in that, claim that the object of purification and the ground of purification are one, which is the same as claiming that the clouds and the sky are one. End quote. In our case, the purifying agent is the power of Amida, Buddha, a manifested through his name and his pure land, where our incidental stains, that is, illusions and blind passions, are melted and separated from the innate Buddha nature. It is simple logic to realize that the Buddha nature and defilements are not one and the same. The ground of purification is permanent, and the object of purification is impermanent. Please consider whether or not these two are one. The ground of purification is taintless, and the object of purification is the taints. Please consider whether or not these 
2 R1. The ground of purification is utter purity and the object of purification is total affliction. Please consider whether or not those two are one. End quote. Dolpopa, Sherab Gelson, the Fourth Council. Samsara is not Buddha nature or Nirvana, but only a reflection which appears because the Buddha nature exists and is not known. Just like the reflection of the moon and water is not the moon itself, but could not appear without the moon. Only because the moon is real can it be reflected in the water. Only because the Buddha nature is real is there samsara as an illusionary reflection and imperfect imitation. For example, we dream during the night and then we wake up in the morning thinking that we are now awake, living in the awakened reality. However, our so-called awakened state is just an imitation, a reflection, a shadow of the real awareness and awakened state which is to be found exclusively in the Buddha nature. The mistake many modern-day practitioners make is to say that everything is empty and non-existent, including samsara and nirvana or Buddha nature. However, a reflection which is indeed empty and ultimately non-existent cannot appear without a real moon, just like samsara cannot appear without a real Buddha nature. Master Dolpopa said, quote, Is a relative possible without an absolute? Is the incidental possible without a primordial? Are phenomena possible without a true nature? End quote. Samsara appears due to ignorance of our true nature, which is Buddha nature. Buddhahood appears due to knowing or becoming aware of the Buddha nature. Buddhas are those who know and dwell in the Buddha nature, while samsaric beings are those who do not know Buddha nature, and so they dwell in their own mind, constructs and illusions. The world of samsaric beings seems real, and the state of our minds is a very good imitation of awareness. However, both are merely illusory reflections which appear from not knowing the real world of awakening, the Buddha nature and its innate qualities. Thanks to the help offered by Amida Buddha, we'll all come to know this real world of awakening once we reach his pure land after death. Quote, that which is self-arisen, pristine wisdom, ultimate truth, abiding pervasively in all, does not differ in anyone as to its natural purity. But through the force of persons, there are the differences of purity from adventitious defilements and of impurity due to adventitious defilements. Like the fact that the whole sky, which by its own nature does not exist as entities of clouds and is purified of entities of clouds, is not purified of clouds in some areas and is purified of clouds in other areas. Therefore, it is not contradictory that just the sky that is not purified of clouds does not exist in any area. So sky that is purified of clouds does not exist in any area, but due to the area, there is impure sky and there is pure sky. Similarly, while the naturally pure soul basic element of the ultimate or Buddha nature abides together with defilements in some persons and abides without defilements in some, it is posited as the basis and the fruit through the force of the presence of or the absence of defilements in persons, but the entity of the phenomenon or Buddha nature does not differ. Hence, persons who have abandoned all adventitious defilements have no need to again practice true paths because they have completed training and they have already attained the body of ultimate pristine wisdom, that is, Dharmakaya of Dharma nature or Buddha nature. Persons other than them just need to practice true paths properly, because although the final Buddha integrally abides in them, it has not been attained because of being obstructed by adventitious defilements. Moreover, this cultivation of the path is not for the sake of producing a body of attributes, because the uncompounded basic element that has an immutable nature is not fit to be produced by any causes and conditions, and because it has abided always primordially with a spontaneous nature without needing to be produced. End quote. Dolpopa, Sherub Gelson, Mountain Doctrine. We cannot say that empty sky does not exist because in some areas the sky is covered partially or totally with clouds. Similarly, we cannot say that Buddha nature does not exist because in the case of some people it is covered by much defilement, while in the case of others there is less defilement. Buddha nature is the same for all, no matter how many blind passions and illusions cover it. Also, the Buddha nature always exists. It existed before discovering it on the moment of attaining enlightenment, 
and it exists after we discover it. It is not produced and does not depend on anything. Self-cognizing, self-illuminating, pristine wisdom that is non-dual with the basic element is called the ultimate truth, the uncompounded nominant. End quote. Taranatha, the essence of other emptiness. Quote, Maitreya's ornament for the great vehicle sutras says, because thusness, that is Buddha nature, does not d differ in all, and its state of having been purified is the one gone thus, that is the Tathagata or Buddha, all transmigrating beings have its matrix. This means that thusness and one gone thus are one entity, and that just this is the matrix of one gone thus. Matrix of one gone thus, matrix of one gone to bliss, and Buddha matrix are equivalent. Although it resides equally in all phenomena, Buddhas, sentient beings, and so forth, it resides in sentient beings in the manner of a matrix, and it resides in Buddhas in a manifest manner. Therefore, ultimate Buddha itself exists like a matrix in the middle of the mental continuums of sentient beings, and consequently, it is said that all sentient beings possess the matrix of one gone thus. This matrix of one gone to bliss exists in sentient beings, and sentient beings' matrix of one gone to bliss is also called the naturally abiding lineage and basic constituent. End quote. Taranatha, the, other, the essence of other emptiness. Quote, Although just that thusness of a Buddha abides in sentient beings, sentient beings do not perceive it from their own side, and hence it is a matrix that has the meaning of being hidden to sentient beings. End quote. Taranatha, the essence of other emptiness. Quote, Since all sentient beings have the basic cause, the essence of enlightenment or Buddha nature, you are also connected with them, and so you must liberate them all from samsara. End quote. Padmasambhava, Dakini teachings. Quote, Becoming enlightened can be compared to water cleared of sediments, gold cleansed of impurities, or the sky cleared of clouds. End quote. Padmasambhava, Dakini teachings. Quote, what is the difference between Buddhas and sentient beings? It is nothing other than realizing or not realizing mind. The substance of the awakened state of Buddha, that is Buddha nature, is present within you, but you do not recognize it. Not recognizing their minds, Buddha nature, being stray into the six streams of existence. End quote. Padmasambhava, advice from the lotus born. Quote, your material body may be old, but awakened mind or Buddha nature does not age. It knows no difference between young and old. The innate, the innate nature is beyond bias and partiality. When you recognize that awareness, innate wakefulness or Buddha nature is present in yourself, there is no difference between sharp and dull faculties. When you understand that the innate nature, free from bias and partiality, is present in yourself, there is no difference between great and small learning. Even though your body, the support for the mind, falls apart, the Dharmakaya of awareness wisdom, that is Buddha nature, is unceasing. End quote. Padmasambhava, advice from the lotus born. Quote, you may dearly treasure this body of flesh and blood and cling to it as being yourself, but as it is only on loan from the elements, unless you attain the non-arising Dharmakaya, it will soon be snatched away. So treasure and capture the stronghold of non-arising Dharmakaya. End quote. Padmasambhava, Advice from the Lotus Born The non-arising Dharmakaya is the Dharmakaya of Dharma nature, or the discovered Buddha nature. Quote, when it says Tathagatagarbha, or essence of the Tathagatas, it means that we have within ourselves this essence of the Buddhas, an essence that enables us to become a Buddha, end quote. Kenshin Thrangu, on Buddha Essence, a commentary on Ranjung Jorje's treatise. Quote, some people find it strange that samsara should have no beginning because everything must have a beginning somewhere. But not only beings, but all things have no beginning. Take, for example, a flower. Where does a flower come from? It comes from a sprout, which itself came from a seed. And that seed came from last year's flower, and last year's flower came from the previous year's seed, and so on. So the flower has no beginning. Similarly, the succession of lives of an individual in samsara also has no beginning. Although there is no beginning, there is an end, because when one attains the state of Buddhahood, 
there is the end of samsara. The text says that samsara does have an end, while other texts describe samsara as beginningless and endless, so that could be confusing. For an individual, samsara is beginningless, but will have an end. However, since there is an inconceivable number of beings, samsara is endless because there will never be a time when samsara is completely empty. That is why we may see samsara described as both endless and having an end. Although samsara is beginningless, the true nature of the mind can be realized and the Buddha nature can manifest. Therefore, samsara does have an end. But Buddha nature is obscured by incidental or adventitious obscurations, which can be eliminated and removed. In terms of the true nature, the Buddha nature is not stained by incidental obscurations. The Buddha nature or Buddha essence remains pure by nature and it also has the quality of permanence. Therefore, the Buddha nature has the qualities of both purity and permanence. End quote. Kenshin Thrangu on Buddha Essence, a commentary on Ranjung Jorge's treatise. Quote, when the delusion of samsara is eliminated, we reach Buddhahood. So samsara is beginningless, but it comes to an end. Once we reach Buddhahood, there is no return to wandering in samsara. Once we reach Buddhahood, there is no return to wandering in samsara. It is as if there is a rope that we mistake for a snake. Seeing the snake is a delusion, and as a result of that we feel fear. Buddhahood is like the rope, and the delusion is like the snake or samsara. Once we see that there is no snake, then the delusion of the snake disappears, and the suffering of the fear of the snake is gone. In the same way, once there is Buddhahood, there is no return to wandering in samsara. The word Nirvana is a Sanskrit term. The Tibetan equivalent is Nangyen Ledepa, with Nangyen meaning misery, pain and suffering, and Ledepa meaning to transcend. So the full meaning is the transcendence of pain and suffering. Once the nature of the mind or Buddha nature is realized, there is the transcendence of pain and suffering. We leave pain and suffering behind and enter into a state of peace and bliss. End quote. Kenshin Thrangu on Buddha Essence, a commentary on Ranjing Dorje's treatise. Quote, we may wonder whether there is any defect in Buddha nature or Buddha Essence. Buddha nature itself is completely pure and without any fault. It is not sometimes present and sometimes not. It has the quality of permanence. If it is permanent, why cannot we see this Buddha nature? The reason is that it has been obscured since beginningless time. It has been covered up by something that obscures it, so that it cannot be seen. So Buddha nature is pure by nature. It is permanent. It has no beginning. And because of this, it has no end. End quote. Kenshin Thrangu on Buddha Essence, a commentary on Ranjung Dorje's treatise. Quote, All beings are Buddhas because all beings have Buddha nature within them. But this Buddha nature is obscured by the incidental stains, which are the negative qualities of the mind. By incidental stains, we mean stains that are not part of the Buddha nature. The Buddha essence, much as the dirt and rubbish covering gold are not part of the gold. Buddha nature is explained in the text through the use of three examples. These examples are given in Maitreya's distinguishing the middle from the extremes. The first example is of water, which can be polluted by dirt and made muddy. But the dirt is only incidental, because when the water is left to stand, it becomes clear again. The second example is of gold which might develop some tarnish, but this tarnish can be easily removed with a little rubbing without affecting the gold itself. Finally, the sky or empty space is completely pure and unstained, with clouds sometimes appearing to obscure it. But these clouds are not part of the nature of the sky, so they can blow away and leave the sky clear. The purity of the sky is in no way affected by the clouds covering it. These are three examples showing how Buddha nature is obscured, but can also be purified. Nagarjuna likewise explains the obscuring of Buddha nature or Buddha essence with an example of the sun and the moon. The sun and moon in themselves are perfectly bright and clear and have no impurities, but the sun and moon can be obscured by various things such as clouds, dust, smoke and eclipses. In the same way, Buddha nature, which is changeless, can be obscured by the foul defilements of desire, aggression, ignorance, pride and jealousy. So, Buddha nature is obscured by stains, but the stains can be eliminated. Just as once the clouds are gone from the sun and moon, the sun and moon are perfectly bright, and there is no need to create a new moon or sun. In the same way, once what obscures water, gold and sky is removed, their natural purity appears, and there is no need to create that purity. 
Buddha nature is not something that we have to develop or create. End quote. Kenshin Thrangu on Buddha Essence, a commentary on Ranjung Georgia's treatise. There are two important footnotes to this section. The first important footnote refers to the passage, Son of good family, all sentient beings seek the three refuges because they fear samsara. Through the three refuges they come to know of Buddha nature, certainty and nirvana. You can read about the meaning of the three refuges in my books, The Meaning of Faith in Nembutsu in Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, page 207, and Amida Dharma, fascicle 12. The second and final important footnote to this section refers to the term dependent origination. Quote, Since all things in the phenomenal world are brought into being by the combination of various causes and conditions, they are relative and without substantiality or self-entity. From the transcendental viewpoint, this absence of self-entity is called emptiness. From the phenomenal viewpoint, it is called dependent generation, and it is the central doctrine of Buddhism that denies the existence of any form of eternal or substantial being. When applied to sentient beings' endless lives in samsara, it becomes the twelve links of dependent origination. End quote. From the Seeker's Glossary of Buddhism. These twelve are described in the following way. 1. Through ignorance are conditioned. 2. Volitional actions or karma formations. Through volitional actions is conditioned. 3. Consciousness. Through consciousness are conditioned. 4. Mental and physical phenomena. Through mental and physical phenomena are conditioned. The six faculties, which correspond to the five sense organs, that is, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and the mind. Through the six faculties is conditioned six, sensorial and mental contact. Through sensorial and mental contact is conditioned seven, sensation. Through sensation is conditioned eight, thirst, desire. Through thirst is conditioned nine, Clinging. Through clinging is conditioned 10. The process of becoming. Through the process of becoming is conditioned 11. Birth. Through birth are conditioned 12. Decay, sorrow, lamentation, pain, despair, old age and death. Then the cycle is repeated again as after death becomes comes rebirth. <coughs> 